Welcome to New World Next Week. I'm James Corbett of CorbettReport.com. And I'm James Evan Pilato from MediaMonarchy.com. It's an embarrassment to the country. We've got that story, plus the return of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. But first, you know, just after Bilderberg is that other secretive getaway for the powers that shouldn't be, the, the male ones anyway. The headline from KTLA, secretive men's only retreat, gets a $151,000 security contract with Sonoma County, despite criticism. A secretive men's only retreat hosted by an elite club that has included former U.S. presidents and business leaders will pay for security protection from a northern California county after a majority of women on the board of supervisors on Tuesday reluctantly approved that $151,000 contract. The three women and two men on the Sonoma County board unanimously approved the contract with the Bohemian Grove, a private campground owned by the exclusive Bohemian Club. It was the 15th consecutive year that a security contract was approved, which makes you kind of wonder, why is this article such a big deal in the first place? Hey, they did the same thing they've done for the last 15 years. The contract would reimburse the sheriff's department for staff time and related vehicle kind of costs. Supervisors cited the short period of time between their vote and the kickoff of the July 10th through the 28th event as the reason for approving the deal. You know, you should always rush and make decisions because you're running out of time. The concern was we could jeopardize public safety if they were not able to come up with a plan B before encampment. So said Supervisor Linda Hopkins in a telephone interview with KTLA. She feared that even the wealthy, influential Bohemian Club might not be able to find a security detail because of the volume of events held in the summer and the need to book security many, many months in advance. Women on the board had criticized the club at a meeting the week before for excluding women from its event. They questioned whether the county should do business with an entity they say discriminates against women. Shocker, representatives for the Bohemian Club have not responded to telephone messages from the Associated Press seeking comment. KTLA does have a previous article that sort of set this up. Annual Sonoma County Men's Only Retreat hosted by Elite Club faces scrutiny from officials. And so I think for, you know, those bloodthirsty women who need to join a group of eugenics-obsessed technocrats, there is, because I, I remember, I was like, wait, wasn't there a story about Sonia Sotomayor being in the Women's Bohemian Club? And so I dug it up, found the article, Belizean Grove is the name of the group, New York Women's Club, the female answer to the Bohemian Club, and James Sotomayor resigned from the club so she could join the nine holy robes of SCOTUS. So here we are yet again, James. It's Bohemian time. Yes. And as much as you read of that article, I don't think you even got to the deep, most deeply weird parts of it. So I hope people will go and read through the entire article that ends up... Um, I consider myself a gentleman, Hopkins said tongue-in-cheek, explaining that the attention surrounding the controversy might create a public safety hazard. Uh, Supervisor Susan Gorin said the conversation about the retreat, retreat should cause everybody to question how we support cl private clubs, either through our sheriff's contract or other tax benefits. Supervisor James Gore said he acknowledged his po position of privilege as a, quote, white dude, and that he learned a lot from his colleagues over the past week. I am inspired to be with a group of powerful women, he said. Representatives for the Bohemian Glove have not responded. I mean, just, it's so bizarre the way they are framing this, but I guess I get it in the context of Me Too and all of this. This is the only way that you are allowed to address secretive clubs where the richest and most powerful people are meeting with presidents and cabinet officials, past, present, and future in complete secrecy. Don't address any of that. No, but you can address the fact that women aren't allowed to join this secretive exclusive club. That's the issue, and that's the one that will probably resonate most with normies out there who might be motivated to actually go and pick at Bohemian Grove. Let some women in! I mean, not all women, not press or anything, but just, you know, the powerful women, Sonia Sotomayor or whoever. Let them into the, your secretive club. It's so bizarre, but it does actually bring my mind back to when I was first dipping my toes into these waters way back. Uh, and I remember I was listening to a podcast, it might have even been the Alex Jones show, and he was playing a clip of, I, I don't know, it was some protest on Berkeley or some, some guy in Speaker's Corner or something like that. And uh, I remember the clip, the guy saying, people will tell you to be concerned about the Bilderberg Group or that the Council on Foreign Relations is steering our foreign policy. No, the real issue in this country is systemic racism. And I remember at the time thinking, well, are you saying Bilderberg and CFR and things like that aren't 
issues? Those aren't important things that we should be actually thinking about? No, the only thing we're allowed to think about is identity politics. So they're now trying to make Bohemian Grove about identity politics rather than the politics that are going on at Bohemian Grove. If you don't know about Bohemian Grove and the types of things that go on there, I'll direct you to episode 42 of the Corbett Report, where I examined it in some detail and talked to a Bohemian Grove member who did not like being called out on his association with the club. Um, but that's, I mean, this is the only outlet, uh, the, or the only way to steer this into the acceptable conversation in mainstream media. And that's, it's baffling to me. Well, and I won't, I won't repeat it here, but for people to just go look up what Richard Nixon said about the Bohemian Grove, <laughs> it's a typical Nixonian kind of speak. But I, this is the really interesting part. Again, it's this sort of fake fight. So you, we've nailed it right there. This is probably going to be the result. They're going to break it down. Maybe, maybe we can get Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez to get involved and just we got to have some women in there. Gina Haspel needs to be in the Bohemian Grove so she can, of course, talk about torture and running the CIA. This, this has actually been something I've talked about quite a bit recently on the Morning Monarchy in the Media Monarchy Kingdom is that now – it's such, such a great time to be alive. Women now have a place at the table of murderous psychopaths. You've had your crappy Ghostbusters remakes and all the other things that pass for women's empowerment. Of course, selling partially hydrogenated empowerment with the Girl Scout cookie. All these things really kind of all come together. And again, they set up the debate. So, of course, it's fixed. It's rigged. Speaking of meetings, the controlled corporate prostitutes won't talk about our second story this week on Neural Next Week, episode 376, the SCO Summit in Bishik, to address U.S. threats, geopolitics of the region, and cooperation. We haven't talked about it in a while here on New World Next Week, but it's back, at least back in our discussion, and it's back in our discussion because it's not in anyone else's discussions, I think. Shanghai Cooperation Organization, SCO, their 19th summit scheduled to be held in Bishkek, Bishkek rather, Kyrgyzstan, on June 13th and 14th, pretty much right as this episode is being published. All heads of state, presidents, prime ministers in the Shanghai Cooperation Organization are expected to attend the subject summit, U.S. Iran tension, Sino-U.S. tension, Afghan issues, Indo-Pacific alliance, and anti-BRI sentiments all will be top of the agenda and may be discussed in depth. So that's part one. That's the one that they won't talk about. And now there's one that they already didn't talk about. Russia, China, the summit which the media ignored. On June 5th, media projectors zeroed in on President Trump and the European leaders of NATO who, for the anniversary of D-Day, auto-celebrated in Portsmouth peace, freedom, and democracy in Europe, vowing to defend them at any time wherever they may be threatened. The reference, of course, to Russia is clear. Sidebar to this, James, I don't think we've talked about this here, and I know, I guess it's, I'm kind of shocked by it. And of course, you know, I shared it with my wife, and it's just one of these things that kind of slipped by until I looked at it twice. The fantastic piece from Moon of Alabama last week, D-Day and the myth that the U.S. defeated the Nazis. Did you happen to catch the big 75th anniversary D-Day celebrations of all the allied nations, you know, like Germany and not Russia? It's just kind of a very little simple thing that I think just flew past everybody. But, of course, some folks noticed because the Nazi-loving royals deleted it from their Twitter accounts. So that's the sidebar of this geopolitics, James. Major medias have either ignored or somewhat sarcastically relegated to the second zone the meeting that took place on the same day in Moscow between the presidents of Russia and China. Vladimir Putin, Xi Jinping met for the 30th time, 3-0, in six years. Russia has become the largest oil exporter to China and is preparing, preparing to do the same thing for natural gas. The largest eastern gas pipeline will open in December of this year, followed by another from Siberia, plus two huge sites for the export of liquefied natural gas, LNG. U.S. plans to isolate Russia by means of sanctions, also applied by the EU, combined with the cessation of Russian energy exports to Europe, will therefore be rendered useless. James, this was your A number one story you wanted to make sure that we covered this week on New World Next Week. Please tell me more about this. 
All right. Well, uh, this is at least partially a follow-up to a question I received in my last questions for Corbett from last week, where someone was asking about the Shanghai Cooperation Organization and why we never hear about it anymore. Um, so they are meeting, and if there are any major developments uh, in that meeting, I'll be following up with it next week. Um, but this is fundamentally important, and this won't be the first time you've heard about it if you're a regular viewer of the Corbett Report, because I do talk about this, but the growing... Uh, ties between Russia and China are exceptionally important. Uh, as uh, the uh, article you're reading from there, I think gestures towards with Russia being the largest uh, the largest exporter of oil to China at this point and soon to be largest exporter of natural gas. They're becoming, I won't say self-contained, but at least self-sustaining economic partners that that really is an economic engine that means that Russia doesn't have to sell all of its gas and oil to, or gas specifically, to Europe anymore. And so all of the threat of sanctions and blocking, you know, North Stream and all of these pipeline deals and things isn't as important if they can sell all of their output to China. And China is hungry for it at the moment. So it's a, it's a, from a logical perspective, it makes total logical sense that Russia and China would be cozying up right now. And in fact, is the perfectly predictable outcome of the encirclement of Russia and China by NATO. What else are they going to do? They're going to fly into each other's arms, which has to make you think this is part of the geostrategic goal, which is interesting because the geostrategic goal of the British Empire and then the American Empire throughout the 20th century has always been about driving a wedge between any potential rival in the Eurasian landmass. So... Uh, it had to be Russia versus Germany and keeping those uh, forces against each other or or whatever kind of geopolitical machinations had to be done to make sure there was no main rival that could come up on the Eurasian landmass. Because as we know from Mackinder and all of that, it, that's the, the heartland of the world and whoever controls that controls the whole chessboard, the grand chessboard. So that has always been the geostrategic imperative. But here it's almost like they're creating China and Russia as what will naturally be the dominant force in the Eurasian landmass if they do come together in a strong partnership. And that's exactly what's happening. So um, perhaps the the chessboard is expanding or the view of the chessboard is expanding and now they're going to try to encircle the whole thing and, or maybe it's Cold War 2.0 so they can continue the, to ramp up the uh, military industrial contracts. Hugely important, world historically important things are happening right now and right under our noses. And as you say, the yeah, the MSM isn't covering any of this. Don't 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 worry about any of this. You know, just the the future a history of the world is being written as we speak. But you know, you should concentrate on Bieber fighting Tom Cruise or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I, I will be concentrating on media monarchy kingdom because it's completely in my weird wheelhouse. But of course, they are also paying lots of attention to Alexandria Ocasio Cortez doing that bartending shift to push what the big new minimum wage that we've talked about here recently. James, I didn't do it in pre-production, but I imagine we would have more than a couple past links to talking about the Shanghai Cooperation Organization on this very show. And on this very show, we move to our third and final story. 9-11 Victims Fund bill unanimously passes after Jon Stewart publicly shames House panel, grabbing this from Zero Hedge. The House Judiciary Committee unanimously passed a bill on Wednesday, that's today as I'm talking to you, which would permanently reauthorize the 9-11 Victim Compensation Fund one day after comedian and activist Jon Stewart tore the committee a new one on Tuesday, calling them shameful over the number of empty seats on the panel. First responders sitting behind Stewart included retired NYPD Detective Luis Alvarez, who was about to start his 69th round of destructive chemotherapy for liver cancer. It's an embarrassment to the country and a stain on the institution, and you should be ashamed of yourselves for those who aren't here, but you won't be because accountability doesn't appear to be something that occurs in this chamber, said Stewart very correctly. Back in February... Stewart gave the Trump Department of Justice credit for handling the cash-strapped program, saying, quote, the Trump Justice Department is doing a good job running the September 11th Victim Compensation Fund, end quote, said John Stewart. James, I've, I've made this joke for many years on Media Monarchy, and that's that maybe old Jonathan Leibowitz should have asked his brother for a loan ski back when he was running the New York Stock Exchange during the Bankster bailout. So while this is undoubtedly good news, as the air at Ground Zero was not safe to breathe, but let's not forget that this is essentially, he's a broken clock. 
That's he's right two times a day. Let's go back to Media Monarchy, September 28th, 2010. 9-11 updates, censorship, and condemnation. The first couple of headlines at the top of that post. 9-11 was an outside job. Jon Stewart trashes 9-11 truth. So in turn, Jon Stewart's book signing interrupted by 9-11 truthers in New York City. And if there's anything that Coke and Pepsi can agree on... It's, of course, the state. <laughs> O'Reilly says 9-11 truth activists are dangerous radicals. James, this is good news, definitely. I don't know. It's just such a sad situation that it has to fall to people like this to be the leading light of, you know, of, of 9-11. Not just not truth, but just 9-11 help. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, this is an aspect of 9-11 truth, and it's an aspect of 9-11 truth that we can all agree on. Even people who follow in the, the official story hook, line, and sinker, we can all agree that the people who rushed into the smoldering embers there on 9-11 to go and try to save people's lives, they were heroes. No one disagrees with that. They were heroes and did incredible work um, and, if not were willing to sacrifice their lives, did sacrifice their lives in many cases, uh, if not right there on the day over the preceding years because of the, the cancer and other things. This is something that you and I have both talked about in our respective work for many years now. It's exceptionally important that we do support the heroes who did rush in that day. And, uh, and you know what? It's a broken clock, but it is right at this time on this issue. So yeah, we're not going to turn to Jon Stewart for the truth about what really happened on 9-11. But hey, if everyone looks at this clock, then when it is right... We should be pointing to it, and hey, hats off. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna defecate on this. If you go and watch his performance in this uh, congressional hearing, he's spot on. So in this particular case, hey, send it to your normie friends. Hey, this is exactly right. Um, and if you want a good breakdown of this um, from someone who is very much involved in 9/11 Truth, uh, Jason Burmis has uh, his own. Uh, channel up now that he's posting to quite regularly, and he just uh, covered this the uh, the other day. John Stewart tells them who they really are. I'll throw that link in. It's a great video, great breakdown, great analysis, and Burmis as well says hats off. John Stewart is exactly right here, and uh, yeah, it, this is great because again, this is another entree into 9/11 for the normie world. Hey, John Stewart's talking about it. I wonder what else they lied to us about about that day. It's just again, it's just such a weird. We're, it's such a weird media monarchy because the only people that anybody listens to, oh, Ben Stiller went to go talk to Congress. Oh, John Stewart went to – we only listen to celebrities, and now we're at the point where that's who people want to actually lead the nation. Again, James, I, I think I've said this lots of times. I think it's important to keep pointing out that John Stewart and The Daily Show – are the kings of fake news. I, I, I truly believe, at least from far as my normie friends and family, one of the main reasons fake lefties have freaked out so hard over Orange Man Bad is because they watched literal fake news for 20 years. Hey, guys, I think the Bush crime family's lying about this thing. Yeah, shut up. Hey, it seems like Obama's doing the same thing. But yeah, shut up. <gasps> Trump. And now I basically have to turn around and then go, yeah, shut up. <laughs> Uh, I don't shut up. Here's my segue to wrap this episode up, James. I don't shut up very much while I do news, music, memes, and more Monday through Friday, 9 to 5 at MediaMonarchy.com. Got a great new batch of listeners last week, new members, new listeners. Thanks, of course, in no small part to these New World Next Week episodes. Thanks, James. That was such a smooth segue. I can tell you're a radio man. All right. <laughs> awesome. Well, we're going to do it again next week. Until then, uh, thanks for three great stories. Take care. Thanks, buddy.